morning, everybody. I'm Tara Donnelly. I've spent most of my career in the NHS, uh, managing services in hospitals, and the past four at an, in a national role, being the Chief Digital Officer. Um, and then earlier this year, I left the NHS after 35 years. I now work freelance for a number of companies, including Doppler, who've kindly com um, sponsored this session, um, trying to do all I can to kind of provoke people and think more about digital home care. So it's a kind of irony that after 30 years, mostly in hospitals, I now spend all my time trying to keep people out of them. I was so tempted to say, which I will say, is this is what you look like when you leave NHS England, hard job, and you're enjoying yourself in uh, mixed uh, roles, but uh, that would be slightly unfair. So, folks, what we're going to cover uh, for about 15 minutes, and then we're going to have time for questions and answers, uh, which will be interesting in this space, but we'll have a go. Uh, we've got a roving mic so people can hear, is really start to unpack... We talk about virtual wards, we talk about digital care, we talk about hospital at home, and often we interlope them together, don't we? We, we, we mush them up, we kind of describe them as the same thing. Um, <clears throat> one of my frustrations is that we, we don't have an intelligent conversation about what is our care model, our physical care model, what's our digital care model, how we fuse them together, and then we talk about our care models, about really providing intensive support which is what a virtual ward and what then eventually hospital at home in that intensity is all about. So Tara's going to just give some examples that Doppler and the NHS are involved with around the country, um, which hopefully will just set the seeds for, well, what does that mean? What does that mean for you? What do we need to do differently? What should we talk about? So I'm going to hand over to Tara. Thanks very much, Matthew. And Stuart, can we have the first slide, please? And then the next one. Oh, fantastic. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about going beyond virtual wards. Now, the progress on virtual wards is fantastic. I don't mean to diminish it in any way. It is wonderful that over 6,000 people will have woken up this morning having hospital level care in their own bed. That's marvelous. But I think this is really just the beginning. And I'm going to focus today on some really terrific examples that I have seen on my travels about how digital home care is starting to make a difference in urgent care. And as Matthew said, we're really keen to get into a dialogue because you might have terrific examples where you're working that you could share with the group. So SDEC is a really important development, but we're seeing that across the country, a number of SDECs are becoming full. North Bristol NHS Trust is the first hospital, as far as I am aware, that's using home monitoring for its SDEC patients. At Southmead, they're supporting people with a range of conditions, and it includes cellulitis, diverticulitis, return home with monitoring support rather than face admission. Their community services partner, Serona, is providing the monitoring. It started in July, and it's really having great impact and now 20% of their virtual ward patients are coming through this route. So it's genuine admission avoidance rather than simply early discharge. This is a highly replicable model. It would be terrific to have more trusts looking at how they could support their emergency department and SDECs directly. And then when we think about the fact that 70% of acute hospital beds used are due to somebody's long-term condition, the opportunity for change is enormous to take a cohort of people living with a long-term condition, often advanced disease, and provide them with remote monitoring and dedicated clinical support as a wraparound to keep them well at home and out of hospital. There are some great examples. Airedale is one of the best. They've seen a 41% reduction in their emergency admissions for people who are living with COPD. They're now looking after 3,600 people in this way. Um, Imperial has also got very similar results for their heart failure cohort. It's been a major area of interest recently. Very excitingly, we are now going to put one of these together with Bristol um, and a number of people in their HTEF bids have started looking at remote monitoring for long-term conditions. The potential here, I think, is enormous. The impact could be greater than virtual wards. Um, and best of all, we know that patients absolutely love this model. So I would love to see more health hubs for long-term conditions. Again, highly replicable model. 
And then looking at urgent, urgent community response teams. So Hertfordshire Community Trust has a really impressive and mature virtual ward offering. Um, they have a whole range of professionals there, community nurses of all types, GPs, therapists, and the paramedics you see pictured. And they've extended remote monitoring to their UCR to our response so they can provide a Doppler box to people in the home who've otherwise would have gone into hospital. They're working really closely with the East of England Ambulance Service and have demonstrated some huge impact when they have taken the stack directly. Um, and I was hearing that we're also seeing this model starting in East Kent. Again, highly replicable. It's often an incredibly binary choice that when a GP rapid response vehicle or a paramedic turns up in someone's home, that either they leave them at home with absolutely nothing or take them to a hospital with absolutely everything. And of course, so many patients sit somewhere between that, where it would be just nice to monitor them for a few days, but they don't need hospital and all the harm that we all know can come from that. To be able to give them for a period, say five to seven days, this model is being trialled in heart surgeon care. I think this is highly replicable, including to ambulance trusts, as a totally different way to support people, but particularly during winter. And then high intensity users, and Matthew will probably say a bit more about this because his trust has just started this service recently. And using the data that we do all now have, the population health data on who's most at risk of a hospital admission, and equipping them with kit to keep them well at home. In this case, Doppler is also providing the clinical monitoring support. Doppler's actually the only um, one of the tech providers who has a clinical arm that's CQC registered. And some other great examples are Frimley Health and Care, who've been targeting their remote monitoring support to those with the greatest health inequalities. Again, I'm sounding a bit repetitious here, but it's a highly replicable model. This could happen close to where you are too. Um, and then just to finish on the point about patients, so this is Edna, Edna's 90, we sometimes hear older patients don't really get on with technology. That's not been our experience and indeed in the surveys that were done earlier this year where 79% of people of all ages said they would love to use technology to keep them well in hospital, out of hospital, older people, so the over 75s, their response was 89% of them. They know what hospital's like and they would much rather be at home. So the way Edna puts it, I think, is terrific. The service has been excellent. It's so much better for me to be at home. I can have what I like to eat, a nice cup of tea, and a good night's sleep in my own bed. And I feel I made a quicker recovery because I was at home. I'd recommend hospital at home to anyone. So I'm gonna stop there, hand back to Matthew for some final comments, and then we'd love to get into Q&A and discussion about whether you've got any of these five examples locally, or anything else that you'd like to talk about around digital home care and its potential. So I think before we just get into questions with people, um, just a couple of observations. So we've been working with uh, at my trust in Cambridgeshire Community Trust. Now I've got two trusts. I have to remember which one to say. So Cambridgeshire Community Trust down in Bedfordshire and Luton. Been working with Dockler um, since the uh, COVID funds were put to get uh, out and uh, has stained that through. We've now developed the approach that we have segmented our population and are very targeting on because the heart failure was a particular outlier in our area, especially for older people, and we are therefore trialing and going big time on using uh, technological uh, elements in people's own homes to remote uh, to monitor people and to use the Doppler clinical system to flag up to our clinicians when people are uh, deteriorating, when they look like uh, there are problems in their, their home environment. I think I would say two things though. One is, uh, I was chatting to someone from Northampton a second ago, I think this needs people to take some risk because up to now um, I would generally cat uh, characterise as saying well, we can only do it if we have funding for X or we can only do this if someone gives us a slug of money to do this initiative. I think this really needs us to say as providers and ICBs to say we need to take a risk on that this becomes a blended cost in how we support people going forward. And I think then the second point is then it's about the risk of saying where does the benefits, pecuniary, as well as person orientated, where do they manifest? And to get questions going, and Hannah, I didn't warn you I might do this, but 
Hannah and crew in Carnell Farah have done uh, a recent report with NHS Confederation about the investment in community services and in this type of care more generally yielding a greater benefit. And Hannah, can I just start with you, if that's all right, put you on the spot, given that your team... You've kind of done some really useful analysis of X amount of money equates to X amount of outcomes, which go to the heart of the funding model. What would you say that you've seen across the areas where you've done the analysis that help people that risk and go forward? Mm. No. Can I go again? I don't know how to turn this into a question, but what we found is um, expenditure on community services gives you £14 return in the overall effectiveness of your health economy for every pound that's spent. And what we've also demonstrated is it delivers wider economic benefits. I think for some of the points that you're making, Tara, in terms of uh, keeping people in employment, out of bedded, bedded care, returning, uh, to work faster and I guess partly what we were trying to do in, in CF alongside the NHS Confederation was demonstrate to government why um, community services merits this investment not simply for the NHS but for the wider public good. Um, so to, to your point I think people do need to take a risk but I think the evidence is there to do it with confidence that you will take the gains. Um, from investing in these kinds of services. Yeah, thank you. Um, so one pound to 14 outcome, that report is on the Colonel Farrow website and the NHS Confed website. So useful to look there because it is on, I think incumbent on us to say, well, look, there's some evidence there, evidence from elsewhere. How do we go forward? Okay, we're gonna open it up to questions because this is far better if it was interactive. Slightly bizarre, everybody sitting in headphones being interactive, but we'll go with the flow. Where we got it, Tara and I are gonna have to run around and show you our lapels, I think, to get the mics going. So where, where can we start with people who just wanna either comment or questions around the space? Who's gonna be brave and go first? Oh, we'll go on there. Is it working? Very strange. Hi, I'm Carolyn Fowler. I'm Chief Nurse at NCHC, Matthew's other trust. Um, so, really interested in the statistics around the amount of older people that feel that they're literate and they want that activity with technology. I get that, and I've seen a lot of evidence. I'm just wondering if anyone's got any examples where there are areas where they struggle with that. We come from Norfolk, very rural high density of deprivation in a number of areas and elderly and we have had some beginning just beginning with our virtual ward some of the challenges we are having is helping people get more literate with the technology so I'm just looking for ideas and thoughts around that yeah I'm happy to so there are some terrific examples across the country um, I mean the starting point it does matter what technology you're giving people so with Doppler, you get a device and you get SIM enablement. So there's no assumption about what technology people have at home. And that's not kind of universally the case, but that's a big, important step for making sure everyone can join the journey. There are some terrific examples across the country of digital buddying services, helping people like that, effectively almost providing a kind of son or daughter to talk people through at the pace that they require. Um, the Red Cross, has provided some of those services across the country. Sometimes uh, local boroughs do it as well, but it is a really important thing to consider. Um, and there are some examples as well of hospital volunteers being digital buddies as well and supporting people at home. So I think it's, it's a really good question and it's a good thing to give thought to. I would also say that um, when people are first onboarded with the service, that's a very critical moment and um, having listened in on some of those customer support calls, it can take 15 minutes or it can take an hour. That team will take as long as it needs to happen to make sure that person is happy and can complete their first set of vital sign monitoring. It's not done in a rush, it's not production line, it's very personalized and tailored to that individual. 
And a lot of people then find they're surprised at quite how easy the tech is. I mean, uh, one of the patients says that if you can use a mobile phone, you can definitely use this. So there is a, um, a sort of quite important point about design to the tech companies, about making it as simple and intuitive as possible and not resisting adding bells and whistles and keeping it a very simple, clean interface so people can use that regularly. Um, but there are some great examples and Red Cross is kind of leading the way in this space. I think the other thing I would say from our, my other trust, not Carolyn's trust, <laughs> in, down in Luton where we have deprivation for, for different socioeconomic deprivation is that part of the package we get from Dockler is all encompassing. So we don't use anybody's Wi-Fi, we don't actually incur cost for the household. And I think that's really important in, in, because people will say, well, hang on, do I need X, Y, and Z? Actually, the startup is, is the startup and actually we incur the cost as the NHS um, and that's really important. So when I think the other thing I would say is when you're thinking of procuring these systems, you need to get those things right. Otherwise we exclude and we only then focus on those that actually have digital access, which is gonna be uh, just a widening our inequalities. This question in the middle here. Great, thank you. Uh, Richard Robinson, I'm Chief Medical Officer at Mid Yorkshire Teaching Trust. Uh, great question though about how we support our population in, in a transition to, to virtual wards. And I guess when you were talking about risk that came across in terms of the pounds spent, my mind went somewhere else. And whilst we have a virtual ward program, it's successful, it's developing, it's increasing. One of the things I'm wrestling with is how we change that profile of risk within the minds of our clinical teams so that we can get that sort of reassurance and assurance that the care is safe and change some of that uh, decision making. So it'd be great to get some ideas about how the the systems that you have in place would support that or any experience that you have in your programs? Shall I start uh, from yeah. our experience then, Tari, and coming from elsewhere? I, I, it's a really great question because it, it, you know, the risk isn't just the financial risk, the risk isn't an activity risk, the risk is are, have we got the clinical competency and then the clinical maturity to take great risks together? Um, I think I would just cite, I guess, two or three things that we've done. We won. We've, we've taken our time to enable staff to go at the pace that they feel okay. Um, so, you know, uh, <clears throat> I remember when we put the document out from NHS England, it was as ever, do X amount by X amount of date. Yeah, okay, but actually we need to do it safely and effectively, and that's about doing it at the pace our teams can take. The second thing, we have done is made our community teams very interdependent with our acute colleagues. So actually we haven't seconded or cheapied or anybody over, but we have ensured that geriatricians, consultant nurses who weren't in our workforce are absolutely available 24-7 um, through the rotor of on call as well within the acute units to, as you say, anybody can actually then escalate calls or worries for an individual, then you're into what Tara described as SDEC processes uh, in a seamless way. And that has, I think, given our community teams a real sense of, I now don't feel so isolated, therefore the things I know I can do, I know I've got someone on my back to ask and do those. And I think, and thirdly, is therefore we're developing over time our own workforce with ACPs with we will have a nurse consultant in our own fold who will then continue to work with acute colleagues and I think that's the right thing to do is absolutely you know, grow the workforce but grow it appropriately get all the different elements in and actually ask the question where's the accountability where's the decision making who's responsible and track it back to those aspects Sim simple stuff that you're used to in lots of ways but kind of stuff we forget to do, don't we? Which actually gives our staff real support to be able to develop those models. Tara, any brief I, thoughts? I think that's absolutely right, Matthew. And I think it's the single most important aspect of scaling is building clinical confidence in the model. Um, and it happens at the speed of people being confident. As Matthew said, it's kind of, it's a one-on-one -on -one discussion. And the interesting thing about setting up a new service is it's a new clinical model. In many ways, the tech is the easy bit. It's the getting in those clinicians involved in designing the clinical model, and then the tech comes underneath. And when people first set up a virtual ward, I think it's really useful to just think of it in exactly the same way as a physical ward. You'd get a great nurse leader, wouldn't you? You'd put some of your best staff on 
that job. And you go at the and, and I think for, for clinicians who've operated and practiced medicine in the same way for 10 and 20 years, it's worked for them. Of course, they're going to need to be persuaded. You'd hope so, right? They're doing that for good reason. They want to protect their patients. But often, when they are persuaded, the people who are most skeptical become the most evangelical. But it, it's almost kind of man marking, one on one, building confidence and seeing that this has better results for patients. And you can't really rush it. So I think the fact that, you know, six and a half thousand people are there already, that's terrific. But in order to expand, it will be getting everybody else on board. And it's interesting because with some digital changes, it is the patients and the families you need to persuade, not this one. Patients and families ahead, it's actually about the clinical team having that confidence. So that's the main thing to get right, I think. And I think just before I bring gentlemen at the back, um, I think when we look at the graph across England, and I looked at it the other day, there's quite a switch happening from virtual wards being instigated on discharge or through SDEC processes to being accessed from the home. And that switch is happening all the time. And that is all about people taking their time and developing that competency and getting it right. So, you know, um, you're, you're, there is a good regional infrastructure where people can link everybody together and get clinical involvement about areas where you're um, uh, where you may be struggling. So, you know, those are the things to pull on. Gentlemen at the back. Yeah, hi, uh, my name's Mike Hearn. I'm a GP, but Managing Director for Herefordshire General Practice. So I'm, I'm intrigued at the kind of uh, old virtual ward uh, concept and uh, managing risk between the community and how we all work together. And I guess uh, uh, one of the ultimate aims, I guess, of a really good virtual ward service is where we really integrate both the hospital services, community services, and general practice. And I guess my question, therefore, links to that, because uh, the gentleman before was saying about risk, and I think this is one thing that general practice does add to the mix, is to how, how to manage risk. And I'm just wondering to what extent that kind of cohort of integration you've really got with, with all partners in that, in that concept, uh, thinking perhaps around the kind of PCN footprint and, and how we kind of develop that integrated neighbourhood team using this technology. Sure. So, shall I kick off? Yeah, and yeah. Is it the other way around? Um, so, what we're starting to see more recently is some of the federations actually supporting um, uh, the virtual ward model. There's a very active one, for example, in Lewisham. And it is really, I mean, across the country, there's a real mix about where virtual wards are delivered from. It's about half acute and half community. So starting to see some in primary care as well, I think is a really healthy development. Um, and that work is great. They've brought together a bit like um, the Hertfordshire example, the full multi-professional team. GP-led, but they have access to paramedics, nurses, and they're, they're very successfully keeping people at home with that model. So it'd be great to see more of that, because um, there aren't lots and lots of examples, but it, as you say, it brings an awful lot to the party to be completely integrated. And it would be terrific to see a population where um, that's part of the acute trust offer, it's in the community with primary care, and perhaps even with an ambulance service as well. So there's just one system, uh, and I think evaluating that would be so interesting to see where you're managing to, you know, reduce demand across the whole piece. Yeah, I, I think just two other observations. Um, obviously, Tara talked in some of the examples earlier about um, initiating virtual wards or hospital at home when you are co-located with ambulance trust with GP 111 services and GP out of hours. I'm not sure it's a GP 111, but 111 and GP out of hours. There are some great models where people are doing that shared decision making. I think where some areas have struggled, and I've had these conversations locally uh, with general practice, is that issue of going back to clinical accountability. Are we asking general practice to take a level of acuity and risk because they're still their registered patient where previously those people would have been blue lighted in hospital? Well, I think the answer is probably yes, but it, going back to the patient perspective, of course that's the right thing to do. I think the issue then is to unpack that and say, well, are we asking the general practitioner to do anything different? Possibly not but are we clear about where then the medical leadership and support comes? And I think 
our, our development, say down in Luton and Bedfordshire, is also thinking then through, well, okay, there aren't that many geriatricians in the world. We're not training enough geriatricians. We are not going to get enough geriatricians, but there might be loads of general practice who could actually do that extra training that perhaps they used to do in the past and actually have that special interest and have that portfolio that could probably do that. So I think it's a mix and match about a bog standard accountability, get the clinical model right, know who's calling the shots on things and taking responsibility, and B, then develop your workforce model as a, a, appropriately. Where else are we? A question over here. I don't know. I've lost track where the mic is now. Where is it? Oh, it's there. People just thought in such a small space it was uh, hard to get a mic around. Here we go. Do wave if you want to ask anything else, and I'll bring you in. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, I'm Felix Davis. I'm uh, from a charity called Combat Stress. We are a veterans mental health charity. Uh, the GP gentleman that talked about the partnership working, to that list I'd add the third sector. Um, and as a charity with scarce resources, just want to go back to the earlier point around the, the, the hardware, software support, the, the buddy uh, around using the actual digital technology. Go on, have a go. Okay. So, so what I'm mindful of is that we might have multiple providers from different sectors all going into the same person or family, potentially with multiple platforms and multiple hardware, software. So having some sort of cross-sector provider coordination as to who's going in would be really helpful. Otherwise, there's the danger of gaps and duplication. So yeah. just wondering if you've got any thoughts on that. Let's just, because I think I didn't hear that call. Was that go on to the next thing? Let's just take two really quick questions and then we'll just wrap up. So there was one there and one over there and then we'll uh, we'll close. Thank you. Um, yeah, Giles Mahoney, working with National Association of Primary Care. Um, I, this, I, my question is really about the scale of the opportunity because I think a number of us have believers in this for years, but Europe and the US have got on with this. There is a scarcity of real capital for buildings, so this is better use of capital in my view. But what, what would you say was the sense of scale of opportunity in terms of this is playing with it perhaps, we really need to push it into a different okay. scale? Okay, I'm going to just take one more and then... Uh, good morning, Mark Bailey, uh, non-exec director at an acute in uh, Yorkshire and the community health service in, in Derbyshire. My question is about data and are we learning on the algorithms from the conditions we're monitoring and managing that we can change those, you know, those alert levels with the risk, understanding of risk. So this model is used in aviation that keeps thousands and thousands of people safe every day. So I'll bring Tara in for the data aspect in your system, but I think just going back to what's the opportunity and how do we do it? I think data sharing is the key issue. You know, it's not just these type of services that are open We've got to remember there's a whole tech industry out there uh, funded by housing, funded by social care, which I would also include on that aspect of actually using technology. I think that's really untapped. There's a great organization called the TSA, which is the, remember what they're called? Um, Technology. Service Association, yeah. and they bring all the tech suppliers. I think there's a great issue there to get interoperability. So we're all looking, probably through the shared care record, of actually who's, the, which goes to your point, Felix, is actually do we know who's going in? Opportunity. I think it's, I mean, I, I, I was saying to Tara and I was chatting to a clinician who's at a very specialist trust talking about sleep apnea and actually why do we do sleep apnea studies in, in a hospital any longer? Why aren't we using technology at home? That's not a virtual ward, that's digital care in its sense and that's about different, disaggregating those two things. But I, I think we're just scratching the surface given that we started with frailty and respiratory world frailty is still not done, uh, frailty will never be done, and we need to do lots more. So I wouldn't want to quantify it unless, Tara, you have a wonderful answer So uh, I'm going to just give a quick answer on all of them. So you're absolutely right. It has been a very fragmented picture, but we're seeing ICSs, and in some cases, groups of ICSs, harmonise. So they're trying not to confuse residents with different um, platforms. The data is super important. At the moment, all clinical monitoring is done by human beings. You can see that in the future, we can have technology help us with that, which will help the manpower issue even more. And then how far could it go? I totally agree with Matthew's answer. I think we'll look back and think, what were we doing hospitalizing frail people, children? You know, that was crazy. 
Um, there are 10 million people living with more than one long-term condition. We know that their health use is huge, they cost a fortune. What if we were to equip all of them routinely with remote monitoring and keep an eye on them? So I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's that kind of direction. Maybe we finish there? Yeah, Yeah, folks, I hope that's been helpful um, in our bizarre environment. Um, Docklers stand over there. Other tech available people are available, of course, I should say, but they're, they're, given it's a Doppler session, I should say that. Uh, please do talk to Tara and crew and um, look forward to linking people up on as they journey down this route. Have a rest of a great conference. Thank you.